Thank you very much. Um, I checked after that very sobering lecture from Tony Fauci, the stock for Gojo, which is the, uh, they own the brand for Purell, it spiked just in the last few minutes, um, was definitely a sobering story and, and part of the reason for bringing the group together. I want to thank Len Blavatnik very much for his support of innovation in this community, especially in innovation in spaces like this where the market may not be the driver. Uh, I've been in discussions with Peter Barrett about extending the Blavatnik Life Sciences Fellowship competition to include graduates of Harvard Medical School, where, I, where we obviously have a very, very significant number of folks who are interested in turning their medical education into entrepreneurship. The control of infectious disease by public health measures, uh, clean water, vaccines, antibiotics, certainly one of the triumphs of modern medicine. My grandfather was a, was a horse and buggy doctor. He graduated from medical school in 1912, and he practiced in the pre-antibiotic era. I have a bunch of his textbooks, and uh, at the time, the cutting edge was the germ theory of disease, the connection between bacteria and various infectious diseases. But the textbooks and my grandfather's notes talk about filterable agents, the agents that were so small that they passed through the filters that captured the bacteria. These were, these were mysterious. And we now know these to be viruses, and though not the topic of today's subject, we appreciate that resistance in, in viral populations is equally as concerning as we've learned from HIV. We've come so far since my grandfather practiced medicine. Uh, and indeed, the development of antibiotics has been one of the great uh, life-saving measures of, of modern medicine. But uh, as we heard, uh, an increasing number of infections, community-acquired pneumonia, tuberculosis, gonorrhea, they're becoming harder to treat, and the antibiotics are becoming less less effective. Um, and we see this in longer hospital stays, dramatically increased costs, uh, and indeed increased mortality. So the question that we have is, what do we need to do to avoid Dr. Fauci's post-antibiotic era? What research strategies are going to lead to the development of new classes of antibiotics, and what are the challenges? Now, Harvard is a great place for this discussion. We have a a rich and deep history. And there have been many important contributions to microbiology and immunology, antibiotic, clinical practice. Um, and interestingly, right now at the Center for the History of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School Countway Library, there's a great exhibit on Max Finland. Uh, he's a graduate of the college from 1922, uh, from the medical school in 26. He had a 50-year career as a physician, as a teacher, an investigator, he led lots of path-breaking research into pneumococcus, into uh, treatments. He researched the clinical pharmacology of many different antimicrobial agents. And he did this, I think, in a very prescient manner in close collaboration with industry. So he was, at the time, also deeply concerned about the overuse of antibiotics, and he recognized resistance to sulfonamides uh, which, which he characterized in the early 1940s. So today, antibiotics research, as we'll hear from the following panel, spans many departments, several schools. Uh, we are tackling this problem from the perspectives of biology, chemistry, epidemiology, evolutionary biology, and public health, among others. And today's science panel features voices who are representative of several of those perspectives with panelists hailing from the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, as well as Harvard Medical School and its affiliate, Boston Children's Hospital. The moderator of our panel, Jennifer Leeds, has also spent time at Harvard Medical School. She was a postdoc in bacterial genetics with John Beckwith. She is now the executive director and the head of antibacterial discovery for the infectious disease area of the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research I wish to introduce Jennifer Leeds. Jennifer. Good afternoon. So I am coming up here on the heels of some pretty big names. Uh, I'm not a dean, and I'm not an academic, 
I'm in industry, which is like the bad word. When I was leaving Harvard uh, and I decided to go into industry, it was um, not a very popular move. I'm pretty proud to say that the group that I lead and the environment for people who decide to go into industry has changed dramatically as well, so I'm glad to see that. Um, just to give you a, a, a little um, idea of who I am, because I know many of you, but not all of you. So I'm a 16-year veteran of the pharma industry, 15 of those at Novartis. Um, I've led the NIBR antibacterial discovery group uh, and the clinical microbiology team for seven of those 15 years that I've been at Novartis. Um, in response to the growing th threat of antimicrobial resistance, the NIBR antibacterial team has taken three novel NIBR-discovered compounds uh, into clinical development, and hopefully three or four more on the way. Our group has moved uh, since 2011 to Emeryville, California. So we were in Cambridge for nine years, and now we've been out in Emeryville for seven. Um, we've, my group has supported five in-licensed clinical antibacterial programs, and we continue to support two um, launched and post-approval commitment uh, programs. And I also work very closely with my anti-infective colleagues in the Sandoz Generics Division on their response to the AMR crisis. To date, I've personally evaluated over 300 um, antibacterial microbiome and respiratory opportunities, and that's an early discovery through post-approval coming from both industry and academia. So I've seen pretty much the entire landscape of antibacterial programs, and my personal passion is to build high-value communities, and through those to achieve strategic success through knowledge sharing and constructive criticism and celebration of success. So I see this venue as a perfect opportunity to learn and grow together. So I hope you'll all join me in ask, asking questions of the panel. I have some questions that I've prepared myself, um, but I definitely encourage everybody to uh, speak up with the questions that, that they have as well. I wanna quickly um, talk to you just very, very briefly in a three minute introduction to some of the topics that were not yet covered uh, by Dr. Fauci and others. Oh, that's fine, that's okay, I can see it. Um, so very quickly, is that gonna go? Just to remind everybody that antibiotics are among the most important advances in the history of modern medicine. We cannot do transplant, we can't do oncology, we can't deliver babies safely, uh, we can't do cancer chemotherapy, immunosuppressive therapy, we can't do transplant, any, any of these, of these Modern medical miracles cannot occur without anti-infectives. And that need is gonna continue. Uh, I think this fusion event talked a little bit about stem cell and regenerative medicine a couple of years ago, and with that progress will come the need for anti-infectives to support those, those patients as well. But as we heard, the growing up need, especially in the treatment of gram negatives, is putting modern medicine at risk. Um, and that is due to the increasing numbers of, of resistant pathogens in the population, as well as the increasing prevalence of intrinsically resistant organisms. So these are organisms that don't have to acquire anything from the environment in order to be resistant to uh, current antimicrobial therapy. And the impact of antimicrobial resistance is that fewer patients receive the correct coverage. Those options, even when available, are limited. And then we have to resort to more toxic agents like the polymyxins. This increases prolonged uh, length of hospitalization and, of course, higher mortality. So why is it so hard to find new antibiotics? We heard a little bit about the fact that we know that these organisms often have 20-minute doubling times, so we're constantly selecting for new pathogens. The other thing that I just wanted to bring up is that we also need to think about covering a relevant spectrum. And so while there's a, a lot of enthusiasm for niche and single organism agents, there's also going to be permanently a need for empiric treatment as well, because empiric treatment allows you to be able to treat before you have the definitive agent identified. So when we talk about a target for antimicrobial therapy, we're really talking about a whole multitude of targets that may have different sequences and the different pathogens that are important for us to cover. And then even among the species that might have identical um, proteins, they differ in their intrinsic and acquired resistance properties. So when you say E. coli, E. coli is not one organism, right? You have to be able to cover a whole spectrum of those. The other point that I want to bring up is that antimicrobial drugs are given at extremely high doses. So we dose up to 12 grams a day of antibiotics. And when you think about that, you're talking about millimolar CMAX quantities of these drugs. 
So the solubility limits that we have to put onto these agents, the selectivity, the plasma protein binding properties, these matter. They matter a lot. And so the chemical space that we have to work in in order to get these properties to be correct, to be able to provide safe and effective drugs, is, is very, very narrow. It's much narrower than it is in other fields just because of the concentration of those doses. And because these doses are very high and the markets demand a low price, those cost of goods can be extremely high as well. So these are areas that we need to think about when we're talking about the properties and the business of antibiotics as well as the science. And as we said, the gram negatives are the most difficult. Um, I think some of our panelists will go into this a little bit more. But just to remind uh, those of you who don't work with gram negatives every day, they have two types of membranes. One of them looks more like a human um, typical lipid membrane. And then the outer membrane of the gram negatives are actually polar. So trying to get compounds that can go through two very, very chemically distinct property spaces is a very, very difficult and tall order. And then on top of that, when you get a compound in, of course, these organisms evolved to keep compounds out. But when they enter, then they have efflux pumps that are also evolutionarily selected in order to rid the bacteria of anything that can slide in. Which is why we still work on beta-lactams. So um, I know that there's a lot of kind of yawn when you talk about new beta-lactams, because why are we doing more beta-lactams? But I can tell you from experience that there is an advantage to working on beta-lactams, for example, even though it's a known class. You only have to get through one barrier of entry. So you go through the outer membrane, and that's it. These are relatively polar agents. And the high polarity restricts the access of those agents to mammalian cells. And it allows you to have a pretty nice uh, selectivity um, and limits the off-target uh, tox profile. We also understand a lot about beta-lactams. We understand their PKPD relationships. Um, we understand their spectrum very well. They have a very low historical attrition rate. So if you want to get new agents out, you can work on a class like this. And physicians understand and like to use beta-lactams. So the new agent that we have currently in clinical development is LYS228. It's a novel monobactam that we developed. Um, monobactams are intrinsically stable to metallo-beta-lactamases like NDM1. So that is a class that is stable to that class of beta-lactamases. And then we made them stable to the serine beta-lactamases. So we have a single agent that is resistant to all four classes of beta-lactamases. And that's in phase one. So our new agent is going to solve this problem. I think we've heard pretty clearly that the answer is no. We have continuous selection. We have shifts in demographics. We have more and more invasive procedures. And we have more and more people who are surviving at the extremes of life. Very, very young, very, very old. So this is not going to be an area that is going to go away. And it's going to be an area for which the demand is going to continue to increase. So what's going to inform the approaches? What's the medical need in 15, 20 years? What are the relevant selection pressures? What will be the role of prophylactic and adjunctive therapies? Will there be real bedside diagnostic and susceptibility reporting? And you need both, not just diagnostic. You need susceptibility testing. Will there be routine therapeutic drug monitoring? And then are we going to see an advance in new chemistries and manufacturing technologies? Because this is really an area that I think is woefully underappreciated by the industry. So today we have a panel of experts who I'd like to invite up now. And I think that's the end of my intro. And we'll move into um, hearing from a great group of faculty. You guys can find your seats. Um, and some of what you're going to hear today is going to be translatable and testable in patients in the not too distant future. And I think that combating antimicrobial resistance is the wave of the future because the advances in modern medicine has to be the next frontier. We have no choice. We have to make this work. There's a whole bunch of new ways and approaches to do that. And sometimes we just need to do something different. But that requires a significant investment of resources and a tolerance for a runway that is long enough to provide decision-making data. There is no quick and dirty with these new approaches. And luck will favor a prepared mind. In order to describe uh, the research that my lab undertakes, I want to take one minute to remind uh, the non-experts about where our current arsenal of antibiotics has come from. Uh, in the two decades following the clinical introduction of penicillin in 1940, uh, virtually all of our major classes of antibiotics were discovered. These include tetracyclines, macrolides, cephalosporins, 
uh, rifamycins, lincosamides, and all the others listed here. These incredibly valuable natural products, the product of perhaps a billion years of chemical evolution, are really twofold gifts. First, they identify the vulnerabilities, the targets. And second, they provide lead matter uh, with which to address those targets. Uh, I say lead matter rather than drugs because the natural products themselves are seldom uh, effective drugs. They, they, many of them are toxic, poorly absorbed, and have poor pharmacokinetics. Uh, they do form uh, good starting points uh, for drug discovery. But these molecules did not evolve with evolutionary pressures to be effective uh, in humans. So the way that most antibiotics have been discovered is by a process known as semi-synthesis, where scientists have worked out how to ferment penicillin and oxytetracycline and erythromycin on ton scale. And then in very challenging chemistry, uh, medicinal chemists over decades have found ways to decorate these molecules. And it is almost a truism that by chemically modifying these antibiotics, they can be made better drugs. They can be made safer, more stable, broader spectrum, and better pharmacokinetic properties. But this engine is sputtering uh, to, to an end. There, there really, we've, we've just about exhausted what we can do through semi-synthesis. It is incredibly challenging to modify a, a single position of a molecule like erythromycin uh, but through semi-synthesis. What my lab has focused on over decades now is to devise chemical pathways to build these complex scaffolds from simple industrial chemicals. We focused on molecules uh, that bind to the bacterial ribosome. Here are 13 uh, different natural products that through independent lines of evolution have all converged on a single target. And I think that makes a powerful statement about how important uh, that target is. Here are uh, six natural products or molecules derived from a natural product uh, that all target the bacterial ribosome. And you don't need to be an expert a chemist to realize that these molecules look nothing like one another and that they are incredibly uh, challenging structures. I think if you had taken a survey in the mid-1990s when we began our research in this area uh, and asked chemists uh, about these molecules, would there ever be a practical industrial synthesis of any of these? I think most chemists then and perhaps many today would say, uh, no, and what we have tried to focus on is to, to, to change that, and so I briefly want to tell you about two success stories, the tetracyclines and the macrolides. Uh, we discovered a process that allowed us to assemble uh, the tetracyclic skeleton of, of tetracyclines from these two simple building blocks. And these two simple building blocks were in turn made through short sequences from industrial chemicals. With this technology, Tetraphase Pharmaceuticals uh, was founded in around 2005 or six. Uh, and within a short period of time, chemists there had synthesized more than 3,000 fully synthetic tetracyclines. Uh, most of them had antibiotic properties and three of them are in the clinic. The most advanced is this molecule, now known as aravacycline, uh, which, uh, with a little bit of luck, uh, may see approval in the United States and in Europe in the coming year uh, for the treatment of complicated intra-abdominal infections. This molecule is decorated with a fluorine atom at this position, 7, uh, which is a trivial uh, change, except that it would have been nearly impossible to do through semi-synthesis. But using a fully synthetic platform, that was uh, fairly straightforward to do. That simple change had profound consequences on this molecule as an antibiotic. It made it more potent, it made it safer, and it holds the promise of oral bioavailability, all features which molecules lacking that fluorine didn't have. We then turned more recently, about five years ago, our attention on the macrolide scaffold, very much like the tetracyclines, discovered within one year of one another. Both tetracycline and erythromycin were launched as drugs within the remarkably short period of three years, in spite of the fact that they're both toxic, they're, they're unstable in the acidic environment of the stomach, forming toxic byproducts. 
And all macrolides approved for human use are derived from erythromycin by semisynthesis. We set out to build uh, the scaffold from simple molecules, and last year reported that these eight uh, simple building blocks could be assembled uh, through a series of coupling reactions uh, in just 10 steps in an overall yield of 30 to 40%. Uh, and this contrasts with the linear modification of erythromycin, say, to produce the clinical candidate solithromycin. But this is a platform, an engine for discovery, because we can modify the scaffold uh, through the building blocks or in, in, through intermediates. And chemists at Macrolide, as well as in my laboratory, have since made approximately 1,500 fully synthetic macrolides. And, and our goal as a company was to transform macrolides, which are historically gram-positive focused agents, into gram-negative focused agents. And here are data from three different chemically distinct scaffolds uh, against a variety of gram-negative bacteria. I'll focus just on this Klebsiella pneumonia since that was brought up by a previous speaker. This is a current clinical isolate. It is multi-drug resistant. And we have MICs of one and two micrograms per mil against that strain. And you can see that neither erythromycin nor azithromycin has any activity in that strain. And, and we're, we're just getting started. So we're, we're very, very excited to move to become a clinical stage company. All right, I just put uh, three slides together to describe the, the program that um, my lab works on here at Harvard. So uh, we're primarily interested in gram-negative bacteria, and in particular, we're very interested in a specific piece of the bacterial physiology of the gram-negative bacterium, which is the outer membrane. And um, uh, this slide is just used, uh, again, as Jen had mentioned previously, for those of you who weren't familiar with the anatomy of uh, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, uh, the outer membrane is, the, is really the, the piece of physiology which uh, distinguishes the gram-positive from the gram-negative bacterium. And I use this slide just to point out that uh, the bacterial world was divided in two by gram in the 1880s, and then it took about 80 years before we began to understand the basis of what the gram stain was uh, distinguishing between. So it was only in the 1960s that we began to appreciate that bugs that didn't stain with the gram stain had an additional second membrane that surrounds the peptidoglycan that gives these gram-negative bacteria uh, this additional tolerance to many antibiotics. And um, uh, actually, uh, after the discovery in the 1960s of the presence of this second membrane, very rapidly people began to characterize uh, this outer membrane of the gram-negative organism. And in the early 1970s, it became clear that this was a very special membrane, as Jen mentioned in her introduction. It's uh, the cell surface of all gram-negative bacteria are primarily uh, composed of lipopolysaccharide, which is a very unusual glycolipid, which uh, prevents uh, the entry of large classes of uh, antibiotics that can normally uh, penetrate the gram-positive uh, cell membrane. The, um, the work that we've done actually started with a collaboration uh, almost 20 years ago now with Merck. We were looking at uh, a class of vancomycin derivatives which we had synthesized which uh, had some efficacy, actually, among other things, in addition to treating MRSA. They had some effectiveness against gram-negative bacteria, and we went to see if we could understand how they were penetrating the membrane, and uh, in the process of studying these molecules, discovered a machine uh, which is conserved in all gram-negative bacteria, and this machine's job is to assemble the integral membrane proteins into the outer membrane of the gram-negative bacteria. One of the substrates, and the only essential substrate uh, that it assembles, uh, apart from having a, an essential beta barrel itself, is a protein which um, 
is responsible actually for assembling the lipose polysaccharide on the surface of gram-negative bacteria. And in addition to spending the last 15 years studying the machinery that uh, puts integral membrane proteins in the outer membrane, we've also spent a considerable amount of time uh, we've been involved in the discovery and the characterization of the machinery that assembles the lipopolysaccharide on the cell surface of gram-negative bacteria. So one machine makes the other machine that makes the membrane, and our interest has been primarily over the last uh, uh, 10 years to see if we can develop tools that will allow us to study how these two machines work since Obviously, one strategy for combating gram-negative infections would be to interfere with the proper assembly of this outer membrane, make the gram-negative organisms then susceptible to large classes of antibiotics, which are currently used to treat gram-positive infections, and we do a lot of work in that, in that area. Okay. So my laboratory works on the bacterial cell envelope. Um, uh, primarily in gram-positive organisms, um, such as MRSA. And the, the gram-positive cells are, well, all bacteria are surrounded by layers of something called peptidoglycan. And so what's shown here are just sort of, um, it's intended to represent peptido a fragment of peptidoglycan. And so these chains that you see are, string are representing strings of sugars, and they're connected by these peptide cross bridges. And for the non-specialists, um, Bacterial cells build up very high pressures inside the cell that are pushing outward on the membrane. And so they need this kind of mesh-like framework that surrounds the membrane to survive, because otherwise they would explode. And so um, a lot of antibiotics target the assembly of, the, of peptidoglycan. And the beta-lactams, which have been mentioned a number of times, are, are a major class of antibiotics that, uh, that inhibit them. Vancomycin is another uh, clinically used antibiotic that inhibits those, this, the biosynthesis of this. And so what my lab started doing a long time ago was developing actual methods to study the assembly of peptidoglycan. Uh, and we extended our work to other components of the cell, um, the cell wall in gram-positive organisms. Um, so tychoic acids are a major component of the cell wall, and that's what these things are intended to represent. And they're very important also for the survival of the organism. Yeah. And so we, 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 uh, I started out in a chemistry department, and um, we started by developing uh, strategies to make substrates that would allow us to study these biosynthetic pathways, because at the time I started, there were lots of people working on antibiotics and trying to find antibiotics that targeted this pathway, and yet people didn't actually know how the enzymes in the pathway worked because they hadn't been able to sort of assemble the tools they needed. And so tool development, obviously, is a really important aspect of, of taking antibiotics from uh, sort of discovery um, to the clinic. Um, you got to know what they do. And so um, we've characterized a large number of antibiotics that inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis. This is a, a, an antibiotic we characterized recently. Um, it targets, it's actually what's called a lipid 2 binding antibiotic. And so those are a, a very diverse class of antibiotics that are made by um, uh, lots of bacteria, and they primarily have gram positive activity. Um, and, and they're of great interest. Tyxobactin was mentioned earlier, but they're of great interest because uh, organisms tend to develop resistance very slowly to that class of antibiotics. And so one of the questions that I have for sort of company people who have maybe looked more at this is why have the, haven't these sort of progressed further? Vancomycin has made it to the clinic, but there's a large number of other molecules that I think um, <coughs> have a lot of, uh, certainly, uh, potential. Um, another thing that my lab has done, so as mentioned, we, we study tychoic acids, and, and we have developed methods. We try to develop methods to screen for what I call smart screens that allow you to get bioactive compounds that target a particular pathway very rapidly. And so I won't talk about how we do that. Um, but I will say that these are two molecules that we found that inhibit the tychoic acid pathway. And we found them very quickly without having to chase a lot of molecules um, that are sort of junk um, molecules. Ah. 
And currently, one of the things that we've become interested in is how you can use sort of um, high throughput mutant libraries and next generation sequencing to uh, sort of pre to predict antibiotic mechanisms, but also to identify new vulnerabilities um, in MRSA, but you could apply this to other organisms. And so we have a transposon mutagenesis platform where we can make huge collections of mutants. And so transposons are just, uh, ele well, they're just pieces of uh, DNA that hop into genes. And when they hop into the genes, they can inactivate them. But our transposon platform has these, is made with, trans, with several different transposon constructs so that we can not only inactivate genes, but we can upregulate them. And so we make collections of, of Staph aureus mutants that are, we have 500,000 mutants in our population, and our constructs are barcoded so we can tell which transposon hopped in where. And using next generation sequencing, that's where you get the where. Um, and so we can then take these libraries and treat them with different conditions. A condition could be an antibiotic, and we look for changes in genes. And so each one of these black bars is intended to represent where, trans where the transposons have hopped in. And, um, under, and so we get a lot in each gene. And then under uh, various conditions, you get a loss of those insertions in that cell that mutant, I, I mean, that, you lose them from your, your uh, population, and that tells you that, that, was, that those genes were really important under that condition. And so we can basically look at these patterns of mutants and see what I would call fingerprints for what happens if you treat with an antibiotic. And that's how you get information on the mechanism of the antibiotic, but you also get information about how, what the intrinsic resistance factors are to that antibiotic. And so um, that is useful. And one of the interests that we have is in using this platform to see if we can do, find better ways to, to use antibiotics in combination. And so the hope would be that we can pick antibiotics where we can change the resistance landscape in a way that extends the lifetime of the antibiotic. Um, and we would use that, obviously, in combination with other kinds of information about how resistance is emerging out in the population. So I think although we are sort of in a, in some sense, we, are in a, we need a lot of new compounds, we also have a lot of antibiotics that currently work. And we need to figure out how to use them in smarter ways. Right? Because um, I think that's where, and that, that's one of the things that we can do to kind of keep our arsenal alive. So by way of introduction, my name is Ofer Levy. I'm a physician scientist. And um, my little intro is uh, uh, entitled Bringing Precision Medicine to the Development of Anti-Infectives. Uh, I direct a new program called the Precision Vaccines Program at Boston Children's Hospital, where I'm a pediatric infectious disease consultant. My specialty is taking uh, care of children with immunocompromised and severe infections. I'm also in the Division of uh, Human Biology Translational Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and I also am a part-time employee of the Food and Drug Administration. I serve on the Vaccines and Related Biologic Products Advisory Committee, VERPAC. I fly to Washington, D.C. about once a month to sit on a panel voting, for example, on the latest uh, strains of influenza to include in the vaccine, et cetera. Um, so I kind of appreciate uh, this very important topic from a variety of angles. Uh, so in terms of background, uh, my laboratory at Boston Children's is focused on uh, the change in the human immune system across age. So we model age-specific human immunity to inform development of novel anti-infectives for vulnerable populations. Those vulnerable populations include newborn, elderly, and immunocompromised individuals. There are a variety of uh, approaches we're interested in for anti-infectives. They include antimicrobial proteins and peptides. Those are natural antibiotics that are inside our white blood cells and expressed by our skin, etc. We're interested in adjuvants, uh, molecules that uh, turn on an immune response, and we're interested in vaccines and preventing infections. As a professional, uh, from my professional life, as I mentioned, I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician and scientist. And my motivation really is that it, in preventing an infection, uh, particularly in early life, and any stage of life, uh, can be life-altering and life-saving.
The landscape, uh, this was touched on by Dr. Fauci and by Jen as well. Uh, you know, the biomedical effort, there's an effort now to make it more integrated, but at times it feels like the basic translational and clinical are uh, fragmented. So there's insufficient knowledge regarding antibiotic action in the very young. I confront this as a pediatrician all the time. And it's not just the pharmacokinetics, right? How do you dose the drug? How often do you dose it? But it's also the pharmacodynamic, how the drug acts at a site of infection. There's misuse and overuse of antibiotics in livestock. We talked about that. Uh, insufficient pipeline was touched on. And often reliance, to my opinion, on sometimes some preclinical models that may be poorly predictive. Uh, often anti-infective development does not take into account differences between individuals uh, in age, sex, body mass index, immunity, genetics, epigenetics, all of these can impact a response to an antibiotic or any drug. Uh, impact on addressing antimicrobial resistance in patients include that frequently I'm confronted by making uh, clinical decisions based on incomplete evidence base, the diagnostic limitations in terms of time to diagnosis, failure to diagnose or incomplete diagnosis, and limited assays to measure the presence of microbial components. So in my view, it's not just killing the bugs, but often the bacteria release uh, bacterial components that signal inflammation that can be harmful. Uh, there's limited uh, preventative and therapeutic options in terms of susceptibility, drug-drug interactions, distribution penetration of the drug. Um, now, this is uh, a key figure uh, for what motivates our lab, and this plots the infectious causes of death uh, in the world by age. So the y-axis is the number of infections causing death, and the x-axis is the age of the population impacted. And as you see, it's a U-shaped curve. So infections cause death most frequently in the very young, and then it rises again in the elderly. And we view this as extremely important and often overlooked in biopharmaceutical development because the types of infections, their manifestation, and the way that antibiotics might or anti-infectives might interact with the immune system can vary radically with the age of the population that's being targeted. And this is what we're talking about in bringing precision medicine to anti-infectives. Um, I recently reviewed the area of how immune ontogeny, the change of the immune system with age, impacts efforts to prevent infection in early life, whether it's through maternal in, uh, immunization, whether it's through breastfeeding, and the breast milk includes a lot of immune factors that help prevent infection, whether it's newborn or infant immunization, or the use of probiotics. I will point out that approximately 11% of the globe is born preterm, and among those preterm infants, there's a heightened risk of infection not just in the NICU, when they're in the NICU, but that increased risk persists until they're 18 years of age. This is a major uh, population that we need to keep our eye on in terms of targeting anti-infectives. I'll also point out that in the preterm newborn, there's accumulating evidence that a brief bloodstream infection with Staphylococcus non aureus or Staph epidermidis, which is typically considered a less virulent bacterium, uh, can be associated with inflammation that harms the newborn brain. So the consequences of a bloodstream infection can be very different by age as well. We also uh, will point out uh, that many factors impact efficacy of anti-infectives, including vaccines. There's increasing evidence that sex matters. Men and women may respond differently, not just to vaccines, but have differences in the way they clear certain uh, drugs, including antibiotics. We alluded to age as a factor. We also point out uh, in the lower left panel that giving uh, two drugs at the same time is not equivalent to giving each separately, that there are drug-drug interactions, and that there more knowledge is needed about that, also in the field of antibiotics, and that there are regional, geographic, or epigenetic differences that can impact a response to an antibiotic. Um, this slide got a little bit messed up, but it's meant to uh, illustrate a number of human in vitro platforms we make use of in our lab. Uh, these include uh, an effort to take human white blood cells outside the body, and we can screen using these platforms for anti-infectives, for agents that kill bacteria in human blood. And the growth of bacteria is very different in newborn blood versus adult blood because of different immune factors. We can also screen for agents that turn on an immune response, and we can also employ tissue engineering to model uh, age-specific immune responses in newborns, adults, and elderly individuals. We believe there's a paradigm for using uh, precision medicine in the realm of anti-infectives, that this would include uh, proper preclinical models to help de-risk development, appropriate animal models that take age, sex, and other factors into account, targeted clinical trials, and the use of big data or systems biology approaches.
Uh, I'm Alex McAdam. I'm the laboratory director at Boston Children's Hospital, the microbiology laboratory director. So that's the lab um, that receives all of the specimens from the children cared for at the hospital that are being tested for infectious agents. And we test for those infectious agents using a variety of methods, including culture, biochemical assays that some of you will have done in undergraduate laboratories, for example, as well as mass spectrometry and a battery of um, molecular assays as well. So that's my primary job. I do some other things as well. I do research on the utility of diagnostic tests in children in sort of a broad way. Um, I also do quite a bit in education. I have been the director of the microbiology course for the uh, first year medical students and the dental students at Harvard Medical School for uh, about a decade or so. And finally, what I think landed me up here is that I'm the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, a journal some of you are familiar with. And for those who are not, this is the leading journal in the area of diagnostic microbiology. It is the Coca-Cola of journals in this uh, particular little niche of diagnostics. So the role of the clinical laboratory in uh, opposing um, antimicrobial resistance, the emergence of antimicrobial microbial resistance is, I think, very much underappreciated. And Dr. Fauci, I very much appreciate you mentioning this and calling out rapid diagnostics as an area um, that's required for uh, attention right now. Um, the selection of antibiotics, what Dr. Levy is going to treat his patient with, depends on many things, including the data generated from the laboratory. And those data are generated very slowly. So this is a very optimistic portrayal um, of the kind of information we would give over on day zero to one, we might say we know the morphology of the organism, gram positive versus gram negative, what shape it is, and that would guide selection of some antibiotics, but it would probably be quite broad, uh, meaning that he would be choosing antibiotics that would treat a wide variety of pathogens because he can't narrow yet. The next day, we might be able to tell him the species of the organism that's causing the infection, and the day after that, day two, is the earliest that we would be able to say what antibiotics this organism is susceptible to. And this is absolutely an Achilles heel in our um, efforts to uh, reduce antimicrobial resistance and development of antimicrobial resistance. I see this primarily from my perspective as a journal editor. Um, this is an area where there is a major push right now to try to get more rapid diagnostics, um, not only, as we've heard, for detection of microorganisms, but for determining what uh, antibiotics they will be susceptible to. So thank you all for the brief introductions. Hopefully you have an idea now of who's sitting on our panel. Um, I have a whole list of questions that I'm, I'm happy to pose to the panel. So this is open to the whole panel. Um, you know, a number of you may want to respond to this. Some of the questions are more targeted towards one individual or another. But the first question I have is, one mechanism for managing AMR, which is a term I prefer over combating, because I'm not sure we're going to combat much of anything. I think we're going to manage it is to develop new agents with some regularity, and ideally in advance of high need. So from a scientific and clinical perspective, what should we be focusing on to anticipate the next unmet need? And then what aspects of medicine, basic science, and technology do we need to emphasize and prioritize to ensure that we can meet those future needs? And how does your work enable that? The, the slide with the 20 years of antibiotics I know many of the experts in the audience want to move on to new classes of antibiotic, antibiotics and, and abandon those classes. But a point I wish I had made is that these are underutilized resources because the vast majority of those complex structures have never been tackled adequately by chemists, chemists such as myself. And, and these are incredibly challenging uh, uh, undertakings. It took us 10 years to develop a tetracycline synthesis, five years to develop a macrolide synthesis. But once these platforms are, are, exist, they can be mined for decades. And I, and I imagine we'll yield clinical candidates for that period of time. And so I think the time is now uh, to have chemists working on these fundamental problems with an eye towards practical solutions because it's going to take years. And, and frankly, in my opinion, the funding is not out there uh, for that now. I think that one option, which we take quite often, is to make second or third or fourth generation uh, antibiotics where we have some confidence that uh, we already have a structure, chemical matter, that um, 
has some utility, and I think obviously that has to continue. Um, my own experience is that if one looks at the chemical matter that's available to discover new classes of antibiotics, um, I think at least as it relates to the treatment of gram-negative infections, there is uh, not enough adequate uh, chemical matter that can meet the criterion of being able to penetrate the outer membrane of the gram-negative bacterium. So we find when we do high-throughput screening and look at hundreds of thousands of compounds that very, very small numbers of, of compounds uh, are even able to penetrate uh, uh, into the, the gram-negative organism. And so I think that what that means is that we're seeing that uh, a very, very small fraction of, of the available chemical space and we need um, new ways of being able to generate uh, chemical matter that has the ability to penetrate. I think that's the key problem for treatment, a discovery of new classes of agents that treat gram negative infections. Yeah, Dan makes an excellent point. This, in fact, your colleague, Heinz Moser, mm -hmm. published a great review article on this. If you look at just, say, the log D value yeah. of, of most compound collections in pharmacy, I mean, antibiotics look nothing like other drugs. That's an excellent right, so point. So I guess for the audience, um, they're, what, they're talk, what he's talking about is it's you screen uh, chemical libraries that you get from mostly commercial vendors because as academics don't have access to proprietary libraries. They're not but much even, better in the proprietary, I can tell you. But that. even <laughs> companies, right, they buy compounds. And so the compounds that, that they buy are obviously made by people who want to make a lot of compounds. And so they're, they tend to be kind of flat and they're made sort of using easy coupling reactions. And so you need to get more sophisticated libraries. There are some libraries that people have made that are more sophisticated. It's very hard to fund follow-up studies with those libraries. And so there are a lot of problems. I mean, so I think we now know how to screen. Um, and we know a lot about how to find compounds. But what we're finding tend to be things that are just, you know, they could be better, and we could find more if we had better, better libraries to work with. So let me see if there's a, a question from the audience. I oh, yes. have one. Thank you. Sir. And this is a follow-up. Uh, my name is Brian Baker. I run a local laboratory for the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, and our role uh, is to respond to public health crises and outbreaks, et cetera. So, uh, when there are uh, crises like uh, the scopes that are used in hospitals, reused and perhaps uh, uh, contaminated uh, APIs or drugs or any number of these things, and we do traceback investigations and we do analyses on these in this lab in Winchester, I'm uh, curious to how we might work together better uh, to maybe be more specific about what we're finding in the short term that could curb some public health outbreak faster. Because uh, making all the linkages to just identifying, you know, the, uh, to be more specific about the species, for example, you've got this library of 3,000 uh, different uh, alterations to these things. We have uh, whole genome sequencing capabilities, but we don't talk to one another about these libraries, et cetera. And I'm just curious, is the, there's room, I think, to do that. And, and we should think about, I'd like to talk to you about how we might be more effective at doing that. Yeah, I mean, you're talking to me. Yeah, <laughs> right, that's what Yeah, so one of the things I think there, that the ability to kind of look at whole genome sequences broadly, because there's a lot of them. People are sequencing antibiotic resistant organisms at an incredible pace. And so you can see patterns emerging in terms of how sort of antibiotic, and you can also track the use of antibiotics in hospitals and correlate them with those sort of, 
changes in the genetic backgrounds, but what we don't yet know is how to then understand what's happening in particular strain backgrounds. So even in the same organism, you can kind of find that one variant of it will develop resistance to antibiotic X, but never Y. And this, another organism will be, develop resistance to antibiotic Y, but never X. And so maybe if you could combine those antibiotics, you would be able to sort of pre cut to, to prevent or slow resistance. But you then need to be, to kind of people like me, need to be put together with people who have that information, because what we can do is we can look at the vulnerabilities in, though in particular types of strains um, and, and try and figure out what's happening at a molecular level using these big mutant libraries. And so the combination of that inf community information with the ability to kind of look sort of deeply um, I think would be really valuable. And so how does one do it? That's a good question. There's a, a new memorandum of agreement between Harvard and the agency. Uh, and I, I think we should explore, perhaps through that vehicle, how to look at this particular issue. That would be great. I'll call you. Okay. Question from Dr. Nelly. Yeah. Um, the panel's focused on targeting the microbe. Um, just wondering what about innovation in the host response, mm. potentiating the host response. You asked my question. You know, in the myelosuppression, <laughs> we have had GCSF, but you know, we can make iPS-derived granulocytes. Is there a role for anything like, of that sort? And like, in chronic viral infection, obviously, there's a, a robust right. biology around T cell yeah. exhaustion and trying to overcome that. Yeah. What about yeah. the host yeah. response? So, so I, I was going to say that, that this is really going to take a multi-pronged approach to, to manage antimicrobial resistance. Dr. Fauci mentioned immunization, and, and that's really key. Uh, there are new vaccines in development. A group E streptococcus vaccine, for example, could theoretically help reduce use of antibiotics uh, in that setting. Uh, and of course, we know that ex you know antibiotics are life-saving. They're also altering the microbiome, and they come a at a cost. We use them when we need to. Um, other examples of this, immunization could also be passive immunization, antibodies we use for RSV to pre prevent in preterm infants, right? They could also be passive innate immunization. So for example, when there's neutropenia, there's deficiency of antimicrobial proteins and peptides uh, from the host. Uh, there's already evidence in preterm newborns that they are relatively deficient in these natural antibiotics. And studies have shown uh, that if you give them, for example, bovine lactoferrin orally to preterms, you then reduce necrotizing enterocolitis and late on sepsis, sepsis in, in preterm newborns. And that's standard of care in some European NICUs now in Italy and other places. Uh, so that is moving forward. Uh, I was uh, involved in a very major effort to try to develop a novel anti-infective derived from neutrophils bactericidal permeability increasing protein. It's a neutrophil uh, protein that neutralizes endotoxin, the surface of the gram negative, and, and that's one of the most potent inducers of inflammation known to humans. In meningococcal sepsis, which is an infection that can kill an otherwise healthy teenager in 18 hours, there's huge amounts of this toxin poured into the bloodstream. And uh, there was a phase three trial done that had a very naive kind of design because y you had kids presenting to a rural clinic in Texas with some lesions on their skin and somebody may have suspected meningococcal disease. They get a shot of ceftriaxone, you kill the bugs and all the endotoxin gets released. And at this point, the kid's going on a medevac helicopter, getting to Dallas to the ICU and the distraught parents are being consented for an intravenous infusion of placebo or the neutralizing uh, BPI protein to neutralize endotoxin. This was published in The Lancet years ago. It was a randomized, placebo-controlled, and there was a benefit shown in the treatment group, but it didn't hit its primary outcome because the overall mortality was lower than predicted because they had made an, an assumption based on data from three years ago and the ICUs had gotten better at treating meningococcal sepsis, but there was reduced limb amputation in the treatment group, et cetera. That's a long and winding story of a biotech failure, but we can learn from the failures and I believe that in the right context, passive innate immunization in the host, who's going to benefit? It's for the folks who don't have the defense factor, whether it's their, their preterm, an oncology patient who's neutropenic because of chemotherapy, et cetera. So I think there's an enormous potential in that area. 
Um, and, and also, if you read the most recent reviews of sepsis, which has really been a graveyard of biopharmaceutical development, uh, y you're going to look and see that people are turning more and more to personalized medicine. We're going to have to define subgroups who would benefit based on host factors and microbe factors. And that gets to the diagnostics as well. So it's all connected. And I realize you were asking primarily in the context of therapeutics, but looking at the host response is also a very exciting area in diagnostics right now as well. Um, so if we can tell uh, physicians that the patient has a viral infection versus a bacterial infection very quickly after the patient comes into the hospital based on the pattern of their host response by looking at the RNAs or the proteins produced by the host response, that can lead them down the correct pathway for therapeutics as well. Uh, Samir Mitragotri, Biomedical Engineering, Harvard. Um, I have a question for the panel and Dr. Fauci as well. So there was a lot of discussion about unnecessary exposure of humans to uh, uh, the agents uh, to deliver antibiotics locally, or at least try them first before going to systemic route. Are you, are you referring to infections that are local, meaning like skin, lungs, mucosal surfaces? So instead of treating them systemically, should we first make an effort to treat them by local delivery so we are avoiding systemic exposure to antibiotics? So sparing whatever the body does not have the infection, why expose the body? Yeah, so there are topical agents that are used for, for you know, truly localized infections. Um, there's also been quite a bit of attempts to treat wound, diabetic wound, um, foot infections, um, uh, and other seemingly localized infections, which actually can become systemic if not treated effectively. So it kind of depends on whether you know for a fact that something is truly localized or whether there's any risk that something is gonna become systemic. So yes, if you have a clarity that, that you're looking at a truly localized infection, then you don't necessarily need a systemic antibiotic, but then that's also not typically prescribed. So. I, I'm, so I'm, I'm agreeing with what you're saying, but I'm, I'm not sure well, well, exactly Well, I, I was wondering, are you alluding to like question. next generation technologies, like nanoparticle delivery yeah. of antibiotics For or that example, kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah, something like that. Yeah, I don't know too, you know, theoretically it's exciting. I don't know whether there's been any technical advance there, you know. So the challenge is in knowing whether the infection is local or having a technology which can actually localize the antibiotic to the site. I, I think the pharmacokinetics have been challenging as well, at least historically. Yeah, I mean, if you look at, the, there was a recent failure um, of Meganin that was thought to be effective locally, and it turns out that it wasn't, it wasn't truly effective in a, in a control trial. Uh, I, want, I want to jump in for, um, for one second, and then I see Jared, because there's always Jared. Um, and this was a question that I had about uh, the diagnostic paradigm. So um, I guess this is mostly directed to uh, with the current paradigm, it's, it's difficult to get diagnostic platforms to support new and niche uh, molecule antibiotic drugs, let alone modalities that are, quote, not traditional, um, such as phages, antivirulence compounds, biofilm disruptors, uh, compounds against host immune targets. And so the question is, from the perspective of the clinical microbiology lab, what scientific advances need to happen to support the appropriate use of those agents, and how can biology and chemistry enable those advances? It's, it's, uh, it's tough. Uh, clinical laboratories don't have the bandwidth to develop assays for the most part. Um, and so we depend on manufacturers for the tests that we use. And in the context of antimicrobial susceptibility testing, those tests um, are usually FDA approved. Uh, so a manufacturer of a novel or new agent needs to keep that in mind as they develop the agent, that there's going to be a need for susceptibility testing in the clinical laboratory. And for the most part, that's going to have to be packaged up um, as an FDA-approved assay. Otherwise, the, the hurdle for the laboratory to bring the test in is simply too high, and we end up sending it to a large reference laboratory or a commercial laboratory, and that's a very slow process. Um, so I don't know that there's going to be good ways to have flexible, um, agile testing for susceptibility beyond what's currently uh, available because of the regulatory structure over it. So for the chemists and biologists in the room, <laughs> do you see any opportunity here for helping in the diagnostic world? Is that something you guys think about at all? I don't think any of the three of us think about the diagnostics 
there certainly are chemists and there are people who are thinking of ways of doing that, right, in, in your department. Well, it, my, my understanding is that there are technologies out there that have improved to the point that you would get a much faster diagnosis, but hospitals don't always take them up immediately because the economic equation doesn't make sense, which is a shame. So I don't know how to crack that nut, but I've heard that said. Yes, I, I think you've heard it from me. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. There, there are faster methods for diagnosis and detection of resistance. Um, but they are prohibitively, prohibitively expensive um, for clinical laboratories. And despite arguments from um, our colleagues and manufacturers that these will offset costs elsewhere, unless we can demonstrate that in a really robust fashion, hospital administration is not going to go for it. So I have to let Jared go. <laughs> uh, Jared Silverman, Kaleido Biosciences. Um, the panel is composed of the people that we might expect to see interested in this space. So we have chemists, we have microbiologists, we have infectious disease physicians. What do you think you can do to find colleagues in the broader Harvard community, different disciplines, possibly not even non-science, to convince them that the most interesting problem they could be working on is, uh, is antimicrobial resistance? That's an interesting one because we all have our slide deck and we can show slides about the burden. Dr. Fauci had very compelling slides. I showed some slide about the age and, and infectious deaths. Uh, but moving opinion or moving somebody, getting somebody psychologically engaged isn't all about numbers. Sometimes it's anecdotes, sometimes it's a personal experience. So it's a, it's a good question. I'm not sure I mean, how the right answer, yeah. I mean, it seems like it's the financial incentive that's the piece that complicates the development of anti-infectives that it would be, it's, it's a challenge. I assume when people come into a clinic with an infection, you give them a generic or you give them the first line therapy and then you go down the, the, the line until you find a drug that works rather than trying to use expensive tools to, to sort of pinpoint the, the, the agent that's responsible. I think that um, the challenge in, in trying to decide should we de develop narrow spectrum or broad spectrum antibiotics is all about financial incentive as well. I'm actually, I'm actually thinking much more broadly than this. Uh, like, like, how do you convince during, somebody who's not thinking about this to start working exactly, in this area? During, yeah. Infect during the, his child. <laughs> during the last few years, <laughs> during the last few years, uh, I was a cubist. We launched something we called Praveen's Crazy Hand Washing Project. Uh, that I won't go into, except to say that you know it turns out that the problem of hand washing, which is generally the subject of, let's say, third-rate research in you know th fourth-rate journals, uh, is actually amenable to some really interesting science. And the question that stuck in my head at that point was, you know, if you walked onto the Harvard campus or the MIT campus and said, "Anybody working on hand washing?" Yeah, <laughs> it would be zilch. If you said, who thinks they could deliver me a device that could sterilize somebody's hands in five seconds or less? I bet you'd get some pretty intelligent people thinking very creatively about a problem that otherwise they would never have spent any time on. So that's One of the things I would, I would suggest is that there's a huge untapped reservoir on this campus of people who've never gotten up in the morning and thought, I could be solving a really important problem here. And I think maybe one of the things we should be thinking about is how do we, how do we get to that group? And this isn't then also just about therapies. It's about prevention. It's about how people behave relative to their you know, medical practice, et cetera. So. so um one question that I have that goes back to something that Andy said is uh, that if not already in use today, many of the clinical used antibiotics would actually fail to meet criteria for progression if they were identified as hits because of concerns about safety, resistance, chemical properties, costs, manufacturing hurdles, et cetera. So the question I have is 
what criteria should we apply to new antibiotics so that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater? And what basic, basic scientific knowledge and technologies do we lack today that, if available, could enable us to move forward with otherwise challenging targets and chemical matter? And how does your work enable that? Well, one thing I wanted to point out was that uh, in the 1920s and 30s, there was a microbiologist named Theobald Smith. And he talked about the Theobald Smith equation. Uh, this equation was meant to help you think about the magnitude of an infectious disease in an individual. And he said it was proportional to the number of infecting organisms. You have more bacteria, you're going to be sicker than if you have fewer bacteria. It's proportional to the virulence factors. If the bacteria are secreting a lot of toxins, you're going to be sicker than if they're not. But all of that is divided by the host resistance. So uh, we, we encounter that clinically all the time. If we have an immunosuppressed or immunocompromised individual or somebody uh, preterm, uh, we know the immune system is distinct and we know that infections can be, first of all, we have to consider a broader range of infections, and we have to uh, realize that the antimicrobials we use uh, may need to be given uh, for a longer period of time uh, to cure infection. Um, and so I, I do think that having technologies in the preclinical end that take into account the host population that we're trying to address um, could be part of the puzzle, um, and, and that that's not always kept in mind. Pediatricians have a big beef on this because a lot of the drugs we use at the hospital every day in children were never really licensed. You know, they're off-label use in pediatrics because there wasn't the evidence base in pediatrics. That's improved through the years because there have been government initiatives to incentivize more information about use of drugs in pediatrics. When I show you the curve about, you know, who's getting the most severe infections, you know, the, the Pediatrics should be the first on the list where we gather this information. And by the way, the infants spread that influenza or RSV to the grandparents, and then they get severe infections. So it's really, as a pediatrician, I have to put, put that out there um, and, and, and feel that, that the preclinical consideration should keep the target population in mind. And that's in an era of precision medicine, that, that should be swimming upstream, hopefully. <laughs> So from the chemists and, and biologists, what do you think about um, criteria that we should be applying to new antibiotics, considering what the criteria, or what, what the properties of the existing antibiotics are and what we've learned from that? I, I guess my reaction to the question is I would never want to do anything that would have the feel of compromising safety. Uh, I think that's paramount. Uh, I'd be curious to discuss maybe offline with you which classes of antibiotics would not be approved in, in this day and age and suggest that perhaps those would be targets for new medicinal chemistry efforts in order to make them safe. It, it kind of depends on what the clinical indication is. If you have a narrow spectrum antibiotic that's going to work to treat C. diff infections, you can deal with poor bioavailability or possibly toxicity issues much easier simply because you're going to restrict, hopefully, where you give that agent. Maybe you don't need bioavailability. Maybe you don't need the level of, of selectivity that you need if you have to administer a broad spectrum antibiotic. So it, you can take chemical matter that is perhaps poorer in some respects if if you've defined a problem where you can limit where you're going to administer, how you're going to administer the agent. So, I mean, I think it does depend. I think the reason people, I mean, narrow spectrum antibiotics are becoming much more important as resistance becomes a bigger and bigger issue because there are simply less agents that are available and, and the markets become reasonable. But I, I really think that a lot of it does depend on a financial incentive. We develop broad spectrum antibiotics because you can make more money on them. We don't, I, I, you know, they're certainly not easier to develop than narrow spectrum antibiotics. So, so the, just, to, just to reiterate, the, the key point of my question was, what basic scientific knowledge and technologies do we lack today that, if available, could enable us, enable us to move forward with an otherwise challenging target in chemical matter. So what's missing? What do we not have available to us in a chemical or biological um, space or, or technology that this group can come to understand if we had that? It's kind of to Jared's point, I guess, but you know what? 
what are we missing that when you go into your labs and you say, if I just had this, well, if you just had it, well, you wouldn't be asking well, a question. But. Well, what, one question I have for the folks who do small molecule screening, I, I, I do it on, on the immune end for adjuvants for vaccines, but now we're talking about small molecules to kill bacteria. Um, are you aware of any efforts to in, in, employ, you know, tissue engineering or microorgans to try to get a lead on whether your screen, you know, what are their what are their properties in terms of interaction with organ systems that you might want to uh, have effect on the lung, etc. I mean, obviously, there's been uh, uh, there have been fundamental advances in tissue engineering and trying to engineer uh, various organoids, etc. To what extent has has screening employed in late phase? Obviously, you'd have to have some leads first. Uh, that those kind of approaches. Yeah, it's good. There are two Sorry, questions. Carry on. Yeah. Because that, that oh. is a technology I can yeah, imagine. No, that's, is that's, it's, it's a very good point. It's, yeah. there's, there, I know of, um, of several areas, especially in lung technology, where that's starting to be examined more. But I have to say, you know, we're, we're starting a postdoc project on it, on lung. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty early days. Yeah, in, but that would, be, yeah. that would start answering at least one. I think you hit yeah. the nail on the head, accessible testing yeah. for toxicity and yeah. accurate testing for toxicity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. John? Sorry. So I just wanted to pick up on two intertwined themes about diagnostics and narrow spectrum drugs. Um, the, so John Rex, I'm an internist, infectious disease specialist, and, and the, the diagnostic question is, uh, I think, sometimes not fully fleshed out. There are some situations where a diagnostic really does tell you what's going on. Uh, if you detect any s signature of mycobacterium tuberculosis in my sputum, that's never, ever normal. On the other hand, if you detect E. coli in my sputum, that's going to happen to everybody in this room right now. A third of the people in this room right now have the pneumococcus in their nose, and yet you all look pretty well to me right now. So one of the issues with diagnostics is that for the diseases like hepatitis C or MTB, which are never, ever normal pathogens, it's easy to do a, a diagnostic that's very powerful. If, on the other hand, you're chasing something that is present in all of us, then simply detecting it doesn't tell me that that's what's causing the disease. And we've really gotten stuck on that problem a lot. And it feeds into the problem of narrow spectrum antibiotics, where yes, sometimes you may say it's the narrow spectrum antibiotic would be very attractive, but they're very hard to develop. To develop a narrow spectrum drug for E. coli would be, I think, almost impossible because I don't know how to do the clinical trial in which I demonstrate the activity of that alone. Because when I see somebody who might have an E. coli UTI, they might have other things as well, and it's, it's very hard to separate those two. So just sort of, there's a real balance, and I think Jen's question about what is it that would permit us to uh, choose more correctly uh, new, new starting points uh, g goes very deep here. And there are there, you know, many layers to this diagnostic and narrow spectrum thing that uh, you spend a long time chewing on and draw some incorrect conclusions if you've not thought about what it feels like downstream to actually develop these things. I, I think that's a great point, and this is absolutely a classic problem in clinical microbiology. Um, there are pathogens that are always pathogenic, but then there are a lot of organisms that can be present as part of the normal microbiota or can be a pathogen, and when you pick them up from the respiratory tract or the GI tract, you don't know what they're up to. Are they the pathogen or are they just uh, along for the ride? I think, and I'm fairly optimistic, that um, the people who are working on host diagnostics, host response diagnostics, probably have the most promising technology for looking at this. Because the hope is that they will be able to say not only is the organism present, but the host is responding to the organism in a way that indicates that this is a troublemaker, that it's making, people, making the patient sick. And along those lines, this gets into areas of, of bench, uh, bedside you know, bioinformatics, big data analysis, uh, et cetera, because there, there are articles now published looking at the human bloodstream, uh, looking at you know, RNA-seq, looking at all the genes that are turned up or down when you have an E. coli infection versus a Staph aureus, et cetera. Uh, I know Octavio Romeo and others have worked on this. And so there's a bioinformatic equation where you can start getting a better prediction than typical biomarkers, et cetera. So that's and again, another next generation kind of big sky thinking, but yeah. 
Okay, go ahead. This is my friend Ellen. So very quickly, so to me, speaking of change in culture and uh, fast di diagnostics, there are fast diagnostic tests all, already. They are not FDA approved, but they are laboratory developed tests, and companies do support them. However, it seems like the biggest hurdle in this area for clinical labs is the reimbursement. So basically, clinical labs would not test for wider variety of different bugs. They would focus on only those bugs that are reimbursed by insurance companies. It's certainly true in many places. It varies from institution to institution. At Children's Hospital, I have never felt any pressure to do or not do diagnostic testing based on reimbursement. It does come up as an issue. It's certainly something that we think about and do our best to get reimbursed uh, where we can. Um, but you're absolutely right. Laboratory developed tests, whether they're supported by manufacturers or facilitated by manufacturers or not, often are not reimbursed by insurance companies. And it's a tough problem. And I was wondering whether, whether there are any initiatives to work with insurance companies or doctors, because yeah. very often it's whatever is prescribed by a physician would be tested for missing all the rest of the spectrum of different bugs. American Society for Microbiology, for example, advocates um, for reimbursement um, on the basis of specific tests, mainly talking to Medicare and Medicaid as they're the big drivers in the area. Um, but I don't that's sort of on a one-off basis. When something is not being reimbursed, they'll go and advocate for it. I don't know of any systematic efforts.